friend from many years ago. Went to church with him. Amen. Stephen was just a kid, a teenager, I think, whatever, when I saw him. Amen. We're glad y'all are here today, everybody. Amen. Others will be coming in here. We got you a good preacher lined up for this morning. Uh, Brother Moody. He uh, he's not here yet, <clears throat> but he should be uh, before we get out of here. And his wife. Uh, but they got up to preach last week, and the Holy Ghost just took over. Amen. And we had one of those services. Amen. And that's all right, isn't it? Yes, sir. Amen. 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 And so uh, we got him to come back again uh, this Sunday minister to us. I'm looking forward to that. And I told him, I said, if it happens again, we'll just put you out for another week. This all belongs to the Lord anyway. Amen. It's not ours, it's his. So we won't let the Lord have his way. And uh, I'm glad everybody's uh, hopefully passed all the COVID junk that was going on. And I think all of our kids are well. They are the ones that had it back. But they're all good, I believe. And uh, anyway, we're going to uh, turn into the Word of the Lord. And last week, actually for several weeks, I've been talking about the kingdom of God <clears throat> and uh, how Jesus uh, came in the same preaching the kingdom of God with that hand. And his uh, forerunner, which was John the Baptist, before Jesus came, he also preached the kingdom of God was at hand. And that's what they come on the scene bringing that message. John, of course, had the message uh, that is still valid today, uh, that we were to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And uh, John preached that Jesus, although John baptized with water unto repentance, he said the one that was going to come after him was mightier than him himself, and he was going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. That's what That's the right. message was that Jesus was bringing, that uh, the kingdom of God was at hand. And then we read, read in Romans uh, chapter 14, I didn't pull that scripture up, but it says the kingdom of God that they preached was, was at hand, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay? And uh, so that's what we've been talking about, the kingdom of God. Sin, I use the analogy, uh, just, just for an analogy. Uh, not that it necessarily is a scriptural teaching, but just to give you an example of kind of what we're dealing with the condition that mankind is in. Uh, we read the scriptures that said that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. All those are scriptures. But you might look at it. Uh, Adam and Eve, whenever they were created in the beginning, they were uh, created in innocence. They had no sin. They were made in the image and likeness of God. They were holy. Okay, they were holy. They were not sinners. They were holy. Okay, in their original condition. And the Lord planted a garden, put them in the garden, and there was a tree of life there that if they ate of that tree of life, they would live forever, according to the Bible. Okay? But there was also, in order to give them a choice, because obeying God is the only way that you can truly express your love towards Him. According to the Scriptures, it may not be your what you think, but I'm telling you, scripturally, the only way that you can let God know that you love Him and express love to Him is obeying him. Okay? Over and over again, uh, Jesus, along with all the prophets and stuff, they declare that message. Okay? <clears throat> it's better to obey than to sacrifice, it says. Uh, one place. Jesus says, He that has my word and keeps it, 
is he that loves me. You know, there's many other scriptures for you to look at. Well, in order to give them a, an opportunity to make a choice for them to be able to express love to him, he had to put an alternative there. And he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there. He gave them everything else in the garden but just one tree so that they could keep his commandment, have the choice to keep his commandment. And if there was no choice, they'd just be basically robots, you know. And you know, you don't get love out of a robot. <laughs> yeah. No. Some, whenever a man marries a woman, uh, you know, they there's a choice involved there. They they want to spend their life together, and nobody's forced to. You can, you might if you was to force somebody, you might. You know, a man might get a wife, but he won't get love. You know what I'm saying? Some, love is something you've got to give. And so the Lord created all this with uh, the ability for people to make choices. That's why he don't make people live for him today. You still have a choice. He can force everybody to live for him. But he doesn't. Because he's out to get their love. That's what he wants. And that's why he came and went through the sacrifice of Calvary so that we would read his message and we would want to embrace him without being forced. You know, without being forced. Anyway, you can look at why God created them because of that very reason. He created them somebody like him. Right? That's what he created. He made man in his image and his likeness. There was nobody else holy but God, and so God created somebody that was holy Amen. in their original condition. And as long as they uh, willfully, of their own will, if they stayed in that place with him, he would have a companion. He would have somebody that was like him. There was nobody like him. If there's one and one God, there's nobody else. There's not another one, but he created a being called mankind that had the ability to express love to him. And that was like him. And they would be like that until they disobeyed him. If they disobeyed him. And they did. They He put the alternative there to give them a choice to obey or not, to express love to him or not, you might say. And they chose to disobey. They chose. They got tempted. They were able to be tempted, just like all of us are able to be tempted. Okay, but but uh, the and the serpent enticed them, you know, to to disobey God basically, and uh, gave uh, them his reasoning that they would be like gods. You know, if they would partake of the tree that God told them not. God already told them, if, you know, don't eat of that tree. If in the day that you eat there, something's going to happen. And you're going to die. Okay? It's going to cause death to come to you. So whenever they disobeyed God, uh, <coughs> they were no longer able to take have access to the tree of life that would cause them to live forever. But they were uh, removed from the garden. Is that Jared? Good to see you, man. Wow, well, some good surprises today. Come on in. But <clears throat> the Bible says that they were driven from the garden. They, that, that garden is a whole lot like the kingdom of God. They, in other words, they were created in the kingdom of God, we'll say. I'm just using that as an example, okay? The garden was like the kingdom of God. And they were in a place of innocence when they were created. And they were like that until they sinned. And the Lord had warned them, if, if you willfully take, partake of that, if you take of that tree, there's something going bad going to happen. You know, you're going to, you're, you're going to, death is going to be, is going to come to you. Don't do that. He wanted them to express love to him by obeying. And he gave them everything else out of the garden. He didn't deprive them of nothing. But the devil came and said, the Lord is depriving you, basically. 
You know, has, has the Lord said you shall not eat of every tree? It made them feel like they were missing out, you know. And uh, But the Lord said, of every tree of the garden you can freely eat, you know. And he put them as lords over that garden. And then he would come visit them, and that's where he'd get his fulfillment with their relationship until they disobeyed God. Then they were driven out of the garden, and uh, the angels were took their cherubim with flaming swords, and they could no longer get in to the garden, or we'll say they were taken out of the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to use. I'm just trying to bring you an understanding of what mankind has come into. Okay? <clears throat> now, they started having children. But none of their children were born in the garden. Do you understand that? It's, it wasn't the, ch the children's fault that they were not born in the garden. It was Adam and Eve's fault that they were, they were not born in the garden. <coughs> they were born outside of the garden where the curse was. Okay? And that's where mankind finds themselves right now. That's how all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us were born in the kingdom of God. Okay, none of us, as again, that's just an example I'm trying to help you to understand. People don't have to do anything to be sinners. Now, we do sin. We do find ourselves committing sin because outside of that garden, there's not innocent. Inside of the garden. Well, Jesus came to give us back. I'm just using this as an example. Okay. But Jesus is all about getting us back in the life of sin outside of the garden. But he's trying to get us back to the tree of the life. You know, the Bible calls Jesus and John calls us, calls him the door of the sheepfold. Well, we'll use it as an example. He's the door back into the garden. His death on the cross is the, the way that we can uh, get back into that place where we are in the eyes of God, we are considered holy again, Amen. where God can fellowship us again. And you know what? That tree of life is in that Garden of Eden. And that tree of life is Jesus. Amen. And you can eat of Jesus, of the faith of Jesus. I'm, not, I'm saying this metaphorically. Amen. You can you can eat of Jesus, the faith of Jesus, and you can live forever. He will bring you back into the garden, as it were, into a place of innocence. And you can you can think, well, ain't nobody innocent. Well, I'm, I'm not talking about that they have earned the innocent themselves. I'm saying that's what Jesus' shed blood does for people. And I know it's popular with people to say that we're all sinners saved by grace. But that that is not what the Bible teaches to Christians. The Bible does not call Christians sinners anymore when they come to Jesus. Not because of what they've done. It's because of the place that his sacrifice has brought them back into a, a condition where they can fellowship God again. A holy place. Amen. He basically brings us back to a place in, a, in, in our uh, relationship with him where he doesn't consider us, he doesn't look at us after our past. He looks at us uh, in, a, in a holy condition. What he looks at us and sees upon us is basically uh, what he did with uh, Adam and Eve when they sinned. Uh, you know, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Remember that? Because they were ashamed. They, they disobeyed God. They broke their uh, innocence with God. And they tried to cover themselves. That's like people trying to cover their, their, their failings and sins with good works of some sorts. You know, people trying to come up with their own concoctions to get rid of the guilt they feel in their heart. Right. You know, you can't. None of that stuff. And I've told you before, the, the Ten Commandments are wonderful. They're great. They're pure. They're holy. But the truth of the matter is the Ten Commandments reveal the condition that we were in. It revealed that we all needed a Savior. You know? It made us all guilty before God. It showed us the holiness of God. That's what it actually did. 
the one that we're dealing with is holy. And it put us in a, in a condition where we are all guilty and in need of God stepping in. And there's no way that we could bring ourselves in our own, you know, in, 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 our, in our own self, concoct a way to get back into a relationship with God. We can, it's good to be good people. We all need to be good people. And the Bible teaches us to be good people. But the only thing that will get you back into a holy relationship with God is the sacrifice of Jesus. That's the only thing that will bring you back. And a good example of that is what the Lord did. When they sinned, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. But our own methods of covering ourselves will not uh, allow us to be in good standing with God. The Lord took, and it didn't tell us what kind of an animal it was, but I would probably say it was a lamb. You know, because that's the example he used throughout the rest of the Old Testament. But he went and killed a lamb, probably a spotless lamb, though it doesn't say that. But the Lord killed an animal. He wouldn't accept their fig leaves, just like he won't accept any of our own concoctions we come up with, like being a good neighbor. I went to Sunday school all, all my life. You know, I read my Bible every morning. That's all good stuff, you know, but it won't get you in good standing with God in, its, in itself, okay? So the Lord took an innocent animal, okay? He took an innocent animal, animal <laughs> an animal that didn't do any of the things that caused Adam and Eve's fall, Okay? There was nothing wrong with that animal. That animal was innocent, wasn't it? And, God, and the Lord, it didn't say he killed it, but he had to kill it to pull the skin off of it. Right. He had to slay the animal, and he took that animal's garment, and he clothed them with it. They still left the garden. They still were out of the garden. But that's a picture of what the Lord does with us. Okay? Uh, fig leaves, our own way, won't cover our sin. But the Lord took the garment of the innocent one and made clothing for them. That way, when he looks on them, he doesn't see self-righteousness. He doesn't see their own concoction of making themselves clean before God or being able to stand before God. But when he looked at them, he saw the garment, the skin of the innocent one. And that's what he sees. Whenever he looks at Christians, he doesn't see self-righteous people trying to earn their way to heaven. He sees them covered with the righteousness of the life of Jesus. That's why we get baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing will bring you back into a holy place with God but that sacrifice. Nothing will. And that doesn't mean that we have a license to live sinful lives after that. We are to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, it says. We are to live holy lives. Because, listen to me, the Lord has allowed us to be brought back, I'm just saying this metaphorically, to be brought back into the garden. And we have access to the tree of life, Jesus Christ. And we can eat of Jesus, and we can live forever. You understand? But listen to me. There's still the tree of choice that's there. And the tree that took them out of the garden is the thing to disobey God, in other words, is the thing that will take you out of the kingdom of God. We don't willfully live sinful lives after we come to Jesus. Jesus has paid the price to get us back in fellowship with God, and that's what the Holy Ghost is. It's us being reunited to God in the kingdom. We're living in the kingdom of God. We're not looked upon as sinners saved by grace, though we have all sinned. But what the Lord did by his sacrifice, he brought us back in good standing. It's not what we've done. It's what he did. It's not our self-righteous garment that he sees. He hates that. He hates self-righteousness. You know, he hates people that, he don't hate people, but he hates the, the action of people 
that think they're above everybody else. You know? But at the same time, he doesn't want to sin him. He wants us to serve him with humbleness of mind and spirit. Realize it's what he's done that's brought us back into fellowship. You know, it's what he's done. It's the garment that he placed upon us. In fact, the Old Testament, I have to look up the scripture because I can't remember off the top of my head. But it calls him the branch. Uh, he's, that's a, a name of, uh, attributed to the Lord. But it says that he is called the Lord our righteousness. He, and when we have Jesus shed blood upon our lives, when we hear about what he did for us, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he did all of that to show his love toward us. This is for God so loved the world. That's probably the most uh, known scripture in, in, in this uh, Christian known. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Should not. They still, some of people are going to still perish because they don't pay attention to it, you know. But they should not perish. He paid it for everybody. They should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. The law did that. You, you know, the law did that, but God wanted people to realize they needed a Savior. So he revealed his holiness in the law. But he sent the, uh, the remedy in Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses, but truth and grace came by Jesus Christ, it says. Amen. Amen. And so he paid the price for anybody that will believe his message if they will repent, in other words, forsake, quit eating of the forbidden tree. Basically, I'm just using it metaphorically. You know, quit doing, quit living the life that displeases God. Turn away from that, and we've all done that. You know, but even if you was the best person to ever lived, and you're not the best one that ever lived with Jesus, you know, He's the only one that's really perfect and innocent. <coughs> Adam was in the beginning, but he, he blew it. And we were all born outside the garden, as it were. You know? But if we will repent, uh, he will restore us to relationship. <coughs> Amen. And that's what he wants. He wants to restore us. If we will repent, and then he gave us his name. Everything that you do, the Bible teaches us to do it in the name of Jesus. Because when you do it in the name of Jesus... You're, you're saying, basically, it's not my fig leaves, anything that I have done, that is going to bring this good thing about, about in my life. It's, it's always, when you use his name, you're saying, it's because of what he did. It's because of the sacrifice he gave. All my trust is in that sacrifice. All my hope is in what Jesus did for me. Amen. Jesus tasted the death that belonged to me. Amen. So even if yeah, when I get baptized, I get baptized with the name of the one that died for me. Amen. And you know what it does? He, at that point, listen to me, Jesus, when he died he on the cross, his last word were, it's finished. You know what he was talking about? Everything that needed to be done to save you has been done. All that's needed is you responded. All you got to do is hear it and respond to it. Amen. And the way you respond to it is by turning away from the old sinful life, be baptized in the name of Jesus. And when you come up out of that water, uh, the old person that you were is buried. That's what it says. That you're buried with him in baptism, but you're rising the new to life, and that's being filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Praise. And the Bible says at that point, you are a new creature. Old things have passed away. That old, everything you used to be, all the guilt that was on your life, and you got a clean slate, a brand new clean slate. In other words, you're holy again. <laughs> but what he did, you're holy again. Well, you don't want to go back to eating that forbidden fruit. Don't do that. If you find yourself.
<laughs> you know? I feel human. That tree, other tree's still there. <clears throat> you know, and if, if I go through a time that I feel that I've messed up, the Lord's not driving me out of the garden. He, he, he wants me to be in the garden. Amen. He wants you to be in the garden. But you can't stay in the garden and continually live off that other tree that, that drove you out of the garden to begin with. You know, you've got to eat of the tree of life. Eat of the faith of Jesus. Eat and devour Jesus. Completely consume everything about Jesus. And you'll stay with eternal life in, in, in you. Amen. You'll stay in a condition. I don't know about you, but I like knowing that if I pass from this life, everything's all right. Yes. You know? I'm, I, I'm, I've come pretty close a couple of times this past year. <laughs> but you know what? I don't, I don't live in fear. Because, you know what? I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I've we've been filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and I'm doing my best. You, you may see some faults about me. I'm surely, I'm not trying to have them. But, you know, uh, he does bring things to my attention. And it's an ongoing process with me. And he's trying to change me to be, you know, he's trying to help me to be like him. You know what? I'm trying to help him. Yes. Come on. I'm saying, here I am, Lord. Amen. Mold me. Shake me. I'm not running away from you. I'm trying to run to you. I will express love to God by, by obeying Him. Amen. Anything He says, everything He wants me to do, I want to do it. Amen. I want to do it. Because that's what He's looking for. <laughs> Nobody's twisting my arm. People that get in church and they, they always try to skirt, uh, skirt the borders. I wonder if I can get by with this and still live for God. You know? They don't love God. That's not what God's looking for. God's looking for people that's running to him. I want to obey the Lord. That's what it's all about. Amen. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen. Praise God. So as he shows you truth, as he shows you more, you know, show to him that you love him by obeying him. Well, that sister Emily did a good job. Amen. Did y'all listen to her? At the ladies, uh, she was asked to speak at the ladies, deal, uh, and she she did such a tremendous job. That's basically kind of what just dawned on me. That's what she was teaching yesterday uh, about the way uh, that you show faith. If you don't, if you can say you show faith, but if you don't have works with your faith, you're not. You don't really believe. And I can't say it better than she said it. She said it great. So maybe we we'll have to get her to say it. You know, praise God. I'd move over this morning and let her do it if she was in here. Praise God. But God wants the whole thing about Calvary is getting you back into relationship with God. And John 4 24 says, God is a spirit. And the spirit that he is is the Holy Spirit. That's the spirit he is. Amen. And, and just being born into the world, we're not born with the Holy Spirit. How I many of you have taught your kids how to pinch? Steal? You know? Disobey? No, there is a... I'm not saying kids are lost. I'm just saying our natural... The condition we are in, being born out of the garden again, we are born with a fallen nature. Even when we get the Holy Ghost, that part is not eradicated. Did you know that? That's why you get tempted to do wrong. You have made the choice to turn from it by repenting. Amen. But it's still present, and sometimes those passions and those feelings that you feel, it comes in such a variety of packages, you know, uh, you know, whenever you, when, you may not be ever tempted to steal something, but there's sometimes people are tempted to steal stuff. Maybe you're one of those good people that just 
don't, you know, you don't want to take something that belong to you. Thank God. But there's some people that have temptations to do that. Mm -hmm. Amen. On the other hand, there's some people that, uh, you know, if somebody says something hurts their feelings, it just blows them into the next world, you know. And they want to cuss them out. Well, that's flesh. Yes, just like that thief, the one that steals is flesh. It's all flesh. It comes in such a variety of habits. It, it, it comes, if you go back into the bathroom, we have vanities back there. They call those vanity still, I guess, don't they? You know? And people go in there, and I, I think they're handy for, you know, I think we all brush our hair and brush our teeth and all that kind of stuff. But there's people that go to decorate themselves, you know, with all kind of things. Comes in, in male or female, you know? But that's vanity. Vanity, that's vain. You go up to the checkout of the grocery store, and they know how men are made. You know, they put all those uh, immodest books up there when you pass by, and, and men have an appetite in that direction a lot of times, the natural man, right. you know? They put them up there. They study what people, they study the makeup of mankind. And they make money off of it. Oh, yeah. right, but all of that are things of that fallen nature. And every one of us have the ability uh, to yield to any of those kind of things. Some of us, again, there's a variety of those things. Some of us are more apt to be sensitive in one of those areas more than another one, maybe. You know, but we all have the ability when we get caught in something, we get tempted to uh, get ourselves out by lying. You know, and, you, and it's just a little white lie, they say. <laughs> but you know what? It's still a lie. You know, and all that. All, all, what I'm saying is, is that we all have the potential. If you see somebody mess up, pray for them. They, you got the same stuff. You made it the same stuff. But what we need to do is we need, that's a nature. Yeah. You understand that? That is, is called fallen nature. And everybody, the best Christian you know, has that a potential in them and will have that potential inside of them right. until the rapture, what we call the rapture. That's not in the, I know that's not in, in the, the uh, Greek. You know, it's talking about being caught up. That's a Latin word used. But anyway, it's talking about when First Thessalonians chapter four, where the Christians are going to be caught up, or First Thessalonians chapter fifteen, where this mortal is going to put on immortality in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Everybody will have that potential inside of their life until that change comes. Amen. Until this mortal puts on immortality, yeah. this weakness. That's a nature, and. The Holy Ghost is the nature of God. Amen. You understand that? And it's a more powerful nature. Okay? The, the, the sin nature is what everybody possesses, but we need that higher nature. Peter called it the divine nature. And that's what the Holy Ghost is. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. Amen. And uh, I've used this analogy. I hope you don't get tired of hearing it, but Anyway, if you take a pig and you uh, you clean it up, you're going to use it for show stock, and you get it all cleaned up and perfumed all up and everything, and, and you take it and you win a blue ribbon with it, you know? And you take it back home and you and you turn it loose in the pasture, you know where it's going to go. Yeah. It's going to go to the mud. It's going to go to that old stinky mud. And you know why he does that? It's because his nature is not to wear a blue ribbon. His nature is to get in the mud and water around, to slop, right? His nature is to, to, to eat unclean things and all that kind of stuff. So if you could change his nature, you could change the pig if we do that. Right. Well, sinners sin because of the nature. Yeah. You understand that? Sinners sin because there's a nature to sin. But God's nature 
if he can get his nature inside of you, he will get, keep you out of the mud hole. And he'll, he'll put you on the road to holy. Amen? Because he is holy. You, he will change your... He won't force you still. You can still have the ability to be tempted, but there's a higher nature that comes inside of you and actually resides in you. The Bible says, He that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. God comes in, and He's the Holy Spirit, and He marries up, you might say, to your spirit. You two, it's kind of like a marriage. Amen. That goes back to that love thing. Amen. Those two become one. God and His church. Amen. He's married up to his church. And he lives and resides inside of, of his people. Amen. And he's a holy God. Amen. And he wants his, his uh, wife, you might say, his church, amen, to be with him and, and, uh, and to be like him. Amen. Praise God. He's not looking for a hooker. He's not. Excuse, excuse the language. He's not looking for a hooker. He's looking for a holy woman. You hear me? He's not, he's not looking for a prostitute. Nope. He saved the many of them, yeah. but he took them from being prostitutes to being holy women. Amen. He can clean anybody's past up, mm -hmm. but once he's married up to you, he wants you to be like him. Right. Amen? Amen? Come on, I'm telling you something. You read the Old Testament. He said, my name is Jealous. Sure. <laughs> Did he say that? Yeah. Come on, he said, I'm a jealous God. He won't share his woman with the devil. Nope, nope. She is all of his. And the she is the church. Right. Amen. What? If, if my wife, you know what? If, if when I asked her to marry me, she said, oh, yeah, I'll marry you, but I don't want your name. I would have said, well, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay there. I'll just go. Go find me one that wants my name. But you know what? She took over my name. Amen. She, that's right. She took over my name. Smart young lady. You know? And you know what? Whenever you marry to Jesus, amen, you're taking on his name. That's right. In Jesus' name. That's right. Buried with him in baptism. Amen. Praise God. Amen. My time's up. I see people coming in. If you want to stand, mosey your aunt, greet one another, get you a drink, go to the bathroom.